Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 136th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Nina O'Neill. Nina is a partner with Archer Investment Management, a hybrid advisory firm based in Raleigh, North Carolina, that oversees nearly 90 million of assets under management for 165 clients. What's unique about Nina, though, is the authentic way that she juggles the realities of being an advisor, a firm owner, and a parent, going so far as to pioneer the advisor video series, The Juggle is Real, about the challenges of work-life balance as a financial advisor raising a family. In this episode, we talk in depth about Nina's own advisory firm, the unique way they use Riskalyze for risk tolerance assessments, not just with existing clients, but as part of the prospecting process, how she also integrates the eMoney Advisor portal as a way to paint the picture with prospects of how their firm works with clients on an ongoing basis, and the unique client service commitment postcard that all clients receive after being on board for three months. We also talk about how Nina's advisory firm is structured, the way the firm decides it handles its mixture of fee-based advisory and commission-based brokerage business, how the firm structured its AUM fee to be an all-in AUM fee that captures the underlying costs of both trading and any separate account managers, why Nina's firm doesn't view the hybrid model as a waypoint to the independent RA model and plans to remain a hybrid firm, and how despite the number of naysayers about broker-dealers and their sometimes overbearing compliance culture, that Nina actually chooses to stay with her broker-dealer triad precisely because she actually appreciates the quality of their compliance support. And be certain to listen to the end, where Nina talks about the real-world challenges of balancing the burdens of being a parent with the challenges of growing an advisory firm, why she decided to create her own advisor video series, The Juggle is Real, and her latest endeavor in launching a new female advisor network, specifically as a community to help empower fellow female advisors in their own path of building an advisory business and balancing the rest of their lives in the process. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoy this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Nina O'Neill. Welcome, Nina O'Neill, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you, Michael. I am honored and super excited to to talk to you today. I'm I'm excited to have you on. You know, I know we've I think really only crossed paths like briefly once or twice at at some conferences over the years, but I've I've kind of followed you from afar. I, I think particularly over the past year or two, you had done some work with investment news and this cool video series called The Juggle is Real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like all of the stresses of balancing family life and business life as an advisor and clients and kids and all of those dynamics. I know more recently launched a female advisor network to try to bring other women advisors together that that struggle with some of this or, or just have to live this. And so I'm excited to have you on just to talk about both your advisor journey itself. I know like so many of us, you've been through a few different firms and channels over the years and all mm-hmm. the all the shifts that go along with it, as well as some of what you're you're building and working on now in in creating community for for other female advisors as well. Yeah. So so maybe to start off, just paint a little bit of a picture for us of the advisory firm as it exists today. Like your the the normal day to day work, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the outside day work as well. Okay. Yeah. So right now I have a business partner, Matt Archer. We're celebrating 10 years this year. So he founded the company just a little bit before I came on board. We service about 160, 65 clients across the country. So I believe we're registered in 16 or 17 states. We manage about $90 million and hoping to grow that as as much as possible as soon as we can. We we really have a, a lot of exciting future vision for for doing more things for more families and and individuals and businesses. We work with 55% of our client base is going to be high income earning professionals. Most of them or quite a few of them have two income earners and kids. So we're trying to be their personal CFO in all aspects of their life. You know, really trying to lead with planning and then we do the investment management. 
about 45% of the rest of our book are, are boomers that we either worked with in their professional years, transition to retirement, or worked with them through a business sale to retirement. Most of them were executives, business owners, sales professionals. There's a few companies in Raleigh that are located here. We have a, a tech concentration, and then we've got the capital of the government's here. We have a lot of education and medical work here. So we find that we'll, we'll maybe start to work with one individual or family, and then we get referred another. And then the people that I really love, I love working with all of our clients, but it's really fun to work with other entrepreneurs because we talk the same language. So we have yeah. quite a few business owners that some of them we've worked with from day one, and we've really had a, an exciting experience as we've grown our business working with them, growing theirs and, and talk to them through steps of maybe people or processes or you know planning tools that they will want to implement as they grow, tax strategies, things like that. So that's a pretty good view of what our, our firm looks like. We do a really wide range of things. We're not a fee-only RIA. I have a lot of respect for those, but we really believe that we want to use all the tools out there that we can. So we do do alternative investments. We do insurance of all types as far as life, health, disability. We do investment management. Most of our portfolios are discretionary portfolios that we run in-house, and then we use a small percentage of SMA managers. But the the bulk of our investment management is going to be in-house models. I run the financial planning operations, oversee HR, Lots of fun things that go with running a business. Yep. If, we, if we need new equipment, I'm kind of the one that's going to go research that or do a project management. We will need to move again. So, And then Matt really runs the investment management and oversees kind of product and approval and due diligence on that. And right now we have three people that work with us. So we have a client operations and relationship management, and then we have a business operations and project management person. So kind of separated the two. And then we have a client and marketing associate. So it's fun. And we're all under 45. So that's kind of unique for a firm that's been around 10 plus years. So That's unusual for any firm uh, in general, but particularly when we are, you're already 10 years in, which means you, you're all under 35 when you, got, when you got started down this road, which is pretty cool. Yeah, actually, my partner and I both started in financial services in our early 20s. I've actually been in the business 15 years, and he's been in the business almost 20 very cool. Very cool. So so tell us a little bit more about services to clients themselves and and what the and what the offering is. So you sort of talked about financial planning plus investment management. That's a a pretty wide range. Just you know, we put 10 advisors in the room that say they quote do financial planning for clients and you'll get 10 different versions of financial planning for right. clients. So what what is what is financial planning for clients and that and that service offering mean to you? Well, we start with a process of really just gathering data. And I think that's pretty typical. We're getting all the information that we can. I have something I call confidential profile. And it's several pages long asking about cash flow. So we're, well, we're looking at cash flow, but you know, money in, money out is what I say, the expenses, the income. What start to get a, an idea of what their lifestyle is like. Some people are more thrifty, some people like to spend more. What are their goals? As far as, you know, financially, if they're retirees or looking at retire retirement, and this is kind of at onboarding, then we're trying to figure out where do they want to live? How many places do you want to have? Are you downsize or right sizing, I guess is really more appropriate. Yeah. And after that process, I use e-money. So I start running the plans and the projections. Again, whether we're working with retirees or people in their income earning years where they're accumulating assets. We like to meet on an annual or semi-annual basis and really kind of make sure that information stays correct and that we're on top of that. So in our client meetings, we're going to do a list of accounts for re reviewing balance sheet, net worth, all that, make sure nothing majors changed. The investment management is typically a core satellite approach. We we don't believe in either active or passive solely. We we use both. We believe in good managers, but also don't want to overpay. You know, we believe in kind of really making sure they have a good price for what their performance is. We do oil and natural gas deals, REITs, BDCs, so all the alternative investments. Insurance is part of the planning for us, so we want to make sure families not overinsured. It's not something we lead with by any means. We're not an insurance shop. We have no affiliation with any insurance companies, but we do believe, and that's kind of a personal story of mine, but that People should be appropriately insured from for disability and for life and to take care of their families. 
And then we do business planning, so retirement plans, cash balance plans, buy-sell agreements. We really have a wide range of what we do, so every conversation can be kind of pretty different in the client meetings, but our clients are so similar that I think like attracts like, and we kind of have two main profiles, two or three. And so we do, we do do a lot of repetitive things, but. So your, your main profiles are these like either high income earning professionals who need one set of planning or you're approaching or transitioning into retirement clients who need a a different frame, different common needs. Right. And then the third profile would be, and they sometimes fall into the high income earning professionals relationship, but would be the business owners. Okay. Okay. You know, because they're they're really, we joke that tax is the four letter word in our conference room. You know, we're really a lot of times trying to help them control their tax liability. We we work in conjunction closely with their CPAs and try to implement whatever we can on our side, maximizing retirement plans and then making sure they're not, I know from owning a business myself, you you may know too, cash flow is always (laughs) something to watch. Yeah. And and we see entrepreneurs and I'm guilty of it too. You leave money in your business because you worry about your business, but you need to take care of yourself financially too. And kind of always making sure both sides of the coin, because we have the ability to help with both sides, that they're really, they've got a healthy balance between the two. And then sometimes if there's partners, you know, we're, we're making, we're working with multifamily situations and making sure almost being a therapist, a financial therapist among par- partnerships, you know, to make sure they're doing things fairly and giving them advice on maybe ways to improve things. But it's the three, the three main, I think pretty much every client would, f- would fall into one of those categories. And so from the, from the planning process perspective, this is a, you know, you'll go through the planning process with us and then we'll figure out wherever it is the gaps are and whatever it is you need. And then we'll start drilling down further in the recommendation phase for, hey, we have some tax strategies to talk about, or we need to fix your portfolio because it's all out of whack, or you've got an insurance gap we need to help with, or, or whatever it is along the way. Right. And we're going to, we use Riskalyze as well. So everybody uses Riskalyze different, differently. I've kind of figured out, or there's a lot of ways that people implement it into their practice, but we do. So how do you implement it? We do it right, <laughs> right in the meeting because I want to read body language. I want to see facial expression. I want to watch the couples argue if we're dealing with two people. <laughs> so you'll, so like you'll input their portfolio, pull up the results in Riskalyze in a client meeting and say like, Hey, let's, uh, so what do you think about those results? You know, your your risk number is this, your risk number is that, your portfolio is neither of those risk numbers. So Yeah, if it's a prospect, we're identifying their number first in the in the meeting and then we have their data. And so in, in the proposal meeting where we're saying here's what here's the planning recommendations, here's what we would implement and changes we would do. That's when we say, okay, you told us without us seeing your investments at all that your number was 65. Were you aware it was actually 98? And are you comfortable with that? And here's what we would implement that's more in the 60, 65 range. And here's how that portfolio behavior would look. If it's a current client, we establish their risk number before they ever see it. Does that make sense? So I, I do that first. I've already got it in Riskalyze because we want, it's almost like a surprise. We got the right number. <laughs> <laughs> so we always say, it's, and it's funny because, you know, maybe they go through the profile and they're 68 and I'm always relieved when I say, okay, well, here's your portfolio with us that we've been managing. It's a 65. We've only twice that I'm aware of, and we've used Riskalyze for years. We're pretty early adopters, but only two, maybe three times have we actually been more than three to five points off base hmm. from from where they established. So it makes us feel good that we can actually demonstrate and show them that we heard them. And then we talk about, we mention portfolio performance, but we really focus on portfolio behavior. I always say to, I like to speak in plain English to clients. And I talk about like, you know, these are ticker symbols to you, but to us, they're our babies and we've known them and used them and loved or not loved them in moments. So I know that if I pick up my five-year-old on a Monday after school and take him to target he is not going to be well behaved and he's going yeah. to beg for treats. And I'm going to be very frustrated uh-huh. because I'm tired. It's been a Monday. And so I, we know how 
these investments behave because we've worked with them in different markets. And so we're not going to leave something in there that's not going to behave well and we know it, but also we might not throw it out because if there's a change in the market, it could behave better. So that's kind of how we explain how we manage money, I guess, and how we're looking at risk and more of behavior as long as they're okay with that range that we've established. So I want to come back a moment to this dynamic of using risk allies with prospects. Because I, I think historically, the process for most firms, just if you talk generally about risk tolerance and risk tolerance questionnaires, was I've gotten a client, they've agreed to come on board, I've got a portfolio I'm going to recommend to them, but I need to give them a risk tolerance questionnaire just to make sure the portfolio I'm recommending is consistent with their risk tolerance, because if it's not, you know, FINRA or, or a regulator slaps my slaps me for giving a portfolio that was too risky than what the client could tolerate. But essentially, it was it tended to get used after you got the client as sort of a check the box due diligence, validate that this recommendation is suitable for them and consistent with their risk tolerance. And you're using it in a prospect process, starting with it, comparing it to their existing portfolio, not even getting to the thing you're recommending, which to me is a an interesting shift in how risk tolerance assessment tools get used. So I'm I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit further just what the process is. Like you 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 send them a riskalyzed link before a meeting, you put it on your website before they see it, you bring them into the meeting and they take it while you pause for a few minutes and like you look at results in the spot. Like how how does this work in inserting riskalyze into a prospect process before they've even become a client? Right. So in the first meeting, we we have just a one page piece that shows our process. And, we, and part of that is establishing the risk and talking about risk. And I'd say, you know, we just want to stay in your comfort zone because we don't want you to jump in and out of the market. We We believe, you know, we understand behavioral finance and we'd rather you invest more conservatively and be comfortable than us try to shoot it out of the park and scare you to death if there's a market correction. So right. we talk about that really up front. And I usually just say, do you have any idea what your portfolio is? And I mean, nine times out of 10, they have some some idea. But throughout my career, and I was relieved and excited to find Riskalyze, and I'm a big fan of it because I think, you know, when when as advisors and industry professionals, we say conservative, it's a conservative portfolio. All that means is it's the percentage of the asset allocation to equities and fixed, in, and fixed income, right? It's not it's not really relative to what the investor means necessarily. Right. Like conservative means different things to different people from their end relative to whatever they've done in the past. For us, it's a like, oh, well, conservative means approximately 30 to 40% in stocks and 60 to 70% in, in, in bonds, which may or may not actually connect to the client's reality. They might just mean more conservative than the 100% in that one stock I used to own, which actually just means a diverse, 100% in a stock index would be conservative and more diversified than what they used to do. Right. And my 91-year-old grandfather would tell you that he, he would probably say he's a conservative investor and he owns 100% equities. <laughs> you know, So at 91, that's a pretty aggressive portfolio. But, you know, he's conservative because he owns you know high quality stocks. Exactly. To him, he owns companies that he knows, he understands, and that he's believed in for years. He he's buying brands, really. Yeah. You know, he and so that's always bothered me because I felt like from a compliance standpoint, we're checking a box, but are we really having a is everybody speaking the same language? And I didn't think they were. And with Riskalyze, I feel like it's translational. We're we know we're speaking the same language and I can identify from zero to one hundred exactly what they mean and show them that. So I can give them a visual representation that yes, we hear what you're saying. Or when they when they tell us that they're conservative and then it comes out to be, you know, 89, I have a better understanding then I say, well, let's talk about because you said you were a conservative investor, but really what you mean is, you know, my understanding from this is X. And so we get very much on the same page. And therefore, when clients come on board, we've established the comfort zone. So if things fluctuate, you know, at the end of last year, it was almost exciting to see when the markets have more significant volatility or, you know, even a negative year. We had more client meetings from January to March than we've probably had all of last year because we were excited to get in front of our clients. Hmm. 
And that's probably not how everybody felt. It's because we wanted to really, one, talk about, you know, face face the elephant in the room. The statements are down. The portfolios are down. But show that it's okay because we stayed in the comfort zone. And, you know, we didn't have many calls or freakouts or anything. It was just more of a question of, like, do we think this is a sustained downturn? And so we really felt it was important to take that potential negative and turn it into a positive. And, and it was great client meetings. In fact, what we found was most of the time they're like, well, we're not really worried about that. We're not really worried about it. How was your Christmas? You know, yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of funny. I, I don't, I don't feel like we really had it many strong conversations. Again, the, the, the main question was, do you think it's will be sustained. And then we talked about what our thoughts were in the markets. And we had a big client event on an economic forecast in February. So I think they have an expectation from day one of how their portfolio should behave. And then we, we stay in that zone, which helps the relationship over time because you've set that expectation and everybody's established it clearly together. So help me understand though, just mechanically how you handle this process. Like when you're with a prospect When exactly do they take the questionnaire? When exactly are you entering their securities, their portfolio in, or are they entering it in? Because I know there's an interface option for that. Like how mechanically does this, does this work through your, your prospecting process? So either at the very end of the first meeting, if we have time, I have tablets in our conference room and we have a big TV in there. And we intentionally have a smaller conference room with a round table. Every piece of furniture and even down to our office space is chosen intentionally to feel comfortable. We don't have what I call the banker look. Our furniture, it looks more like an architect's office than a financial practice. And we like round tables because we just want it to feel very collaborative. So we're all kind of sitting in a a semicircle. There's usually four of us and we're looking at the screen and I'm operating it right. from from the tablet and we're all talking through the questions. But I get to see how couples interact through the, that questionnaire. I like doing it in person. I'll never send the link to someone. Sorry, Risk Live. Hey, we all use it in our own way. So so interesting. Yeah. So you you essentially ask them the like ask them the questions or take them through the questionnaire process and let them on the spot in conversation with each other decide how they're going to answer the next question on the screen so you can see not only what what decisions they make that hones in on their risk number but literally what the conversation dynamics are like between the couple as they get there right right in right in that moment i i can glean a lot from body language how they're interacting with each other. I can see who's who's steering the investment conversation. Is the other one deferring? Big. Is there yep. clear tension? Cause one says, well, I think the number is this. And the other one gets upset, crosses their arms, sits back and says, fine. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. And you can really see who's the financial quarterback in the family. And we usually ask that up front is one of you taking the lead. And I, I don't see it always the male. I'm the lead financial person in my family. So I never make that assumption. And if I do see the female more quiet or the male, sometimes the male is just like my husband would be totally checked out. He has zero interest. But whichever, if I ever see a spouse more significantly quiet, then I start asking them more direct questions because I want to bring, I don't want them to either feel like they can't give their real opinion, but I want them to be very comfortable in our, in our office and in our conversation so I'll try to bring them in with some questions. So what I've found with doing it in an, in a more engaging way and, and being right there with them is I learn a lot about them quickly as a couple in a setting that might be a little formal for them, you know, coming to a financial advisor and they're you know sharing all of their information. Like I love your presentation about it. it's like a trip to the dentist and marriage counseling. Um, yeah, financial planning experience can be actually quite stressful for clients the first time going through conversations they've never been through before while bearing their money soul, which for most people is the most taboo subject left on earth while they were inevitably embarrassed about stuff because if their finances were perfect, they probably wouldn't be in your office in the first place. So like there are mistakes they know they have that they're embarrassed about while they talk about the subject that is the most unbelievably uncomfortable for them and doing it with their spouse with whom they probably have differences that they never realized before or never faced. Like right. awesome way to start a relationship. <laughs> yes, exactly. Welcome to financial planning. Right. And so, and if it, if it doesn't fit in in the first meeting, then it comes at the beginning of the second meeting. So now the second meeting, I have put in their current portfolio. 
So I already know their number if it, if it happens in the second meeting. If it happens in the first, I have no idea what they're invested in because they're going to give me that information and I'm going to implement it into the financial planning software. E-Money integrates to Riskalyze. I push everything to Riskalyze it's, and it's all very quick and easy. And so I'll say, okay, so in the second meeting, let's assume that the, they have not established, I mean, that I have the number, they've not seen their portfolio in it. I'll say, okay, remember, you know, here's your client profile up on the screen in Riskalyze. Remember, you established already that you were 65. And did you know your portfolio is actually, you know, let's say an 89 or a 35 or maybe, you know, just if there's a huge disconnect. Sometimes they're right in line and I'll say, hey, look, from a risk standpoint or portfolio behavior, you're kind of already in line with what you need, you know, to stay comfortable and invest in the markets. But it's not maybe what from a planning standpoint, you're not getting what you need or service. There's some reason they're looking at another advisor, right? So, but if, if there's a big disconnect, then we start talking about why. Wait, maybe there's too much fixed income in the portfolio or you know, we can look at the securities and I use a risk reward heat map and say, okay, these are going to swing more. That's why your portfolio is an 89, not a 65. It's got positions that have more volatility. And the, this to me was the brilliance of what Riskalyze created that, frankly, I think even though they've spawned like half a dozen competitors or more, the none of the competitors seem to seem to get it that like what's so powerful about Riskalyze for advisors that use it this way is that the, like this investment conversation that it's that it sets up that you know most clients do not have a well allocated diversified portfolio on their own you know a few do as you noted but most don't do a great job with this often that's the reason that they're coming in to see us because they're not happy with the results or bad stuff has happened and so there's just this natural conversation flow that gets created in the risk alized process of so let's go through and understand your risk tolerance and your your risk number in, in risk alizes language then we'll analyze your portfolio which has a like 90 percent chance of being wildly outmatched out of right. sorts with your with your risk number and and then i can come in with and here's my well diversified portfolio that is in line with your risk number and it it just it just sets up a fantastic conversation that because so few clients properly invest and diversify their portfolios in the first place, you can get 90% of the way there on a sales process by just showing them, here's what you said your risk tolerance is, and here's how risky your portfolio actually is. Would you like some help to make these numbers line up better? Right. Or we had a we had a young family come in and they said, we just don't understand. We're not, we're just not making any money. They were coming in because they were having a baby and wanted to do real planning and how do we you know, is our family fine? And they had not really gotten that from their advisor, but they said, you know, I said, well, tell, tell me about your investments. What's going on there? And she said, you know, we're not making any money. We don't understand. There's been a bull market. We're pretty savvy. Like, you know, we're, we don't want to do it ourselves, but we, we're aware of the economy. She's a real estate agent. And so when we got back together and I said, your risks, your portfolio is a 35 and you're 28 years old. What in the world? Like, how was that that disconnected from that advisor. And we, we still don't know why, why on earth <laughs> she was put in. Su- they were put in such concern. I said, did you ever say you were a conservative investor? And she said, no, I mean, I just said, I don't want to lose a lot of money, but how, you know, well, there you go. Like, okay. <laughs> you don't want to lose a lot of money. 70% bonds next client. <laughs> right. So I said, you know, but that's what I like about our process because we're really spending time making sure we understand what that means. And that, and your expectation was that you should have made more money. He heard, I don't want to lose money, you know? So I think that's probably the disconnect. I don't think the guy did anything in, in with any ill intention at all. I think it was just a misunderstanding because it's without a tool like that, it's really hard to make sure. Yeah, well, as you said, like if you just throw out some of these words, I'm conservative, I'm aggressive, I you know want growth, but don't want to lose money. Like, you know, that means very different things for very different People, right? Like, as your grandfather might put it, like, well, I, I, I want to make, I, I want to have some growth opportunity without making money. It's like, right, that's my why, why I'm 100% in stocks, but I only pick large caps that I'm comfortable with. And then you just never sell them because, well, would yeah. you, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, that might be his version of, well, you know, I, I don't want to take a lot of risk of losing money because, in his view, well, large mega national brands aren't going to go bankrupt or out of business. 
So, you know, my money is safe and I just hope I get some growth when the companies grow. Whereas for other clients, you know, anything in the stock market that could have a 10% pullback is a freak out moment. So their version of I'd like a little growth, but I don't want to risk losing any money means no, they have to have like a 2080 portfolio to get them to sleep well at night. Right. And I think there's a generational mindset around what risk is and conservative is too. And so we're kind of mindful of that based on the generation we're talking to. We have a multi-generational practice and pretty frequently work with parents and grandparents and then the, the kids that might be in their 40s or even 50s. The language is and approach can be very different from a generational standpoint, just based on their experience. You know, I, I love the the presentation you do with the history of kind of the the business. Well, my grandfather never really had much experience with mutual funds, certainly not ETFs. Because that, you know, he he just started investing in a different time when you bought an individual security and you held it and you got your dividend check. So yeah. there's, you know, just being aware that there's a different generational mentality around the markets with each kind of family we're talking to as well. And and so that that becomes a key anchor for the prospecting process for you then sounds like like first meeting at least ideally first meeting you're going to get their risk number by the end of the first meeting because you'll do the risk wise process with them on tablets broadcast the big screen in the conference room so they're they're going to leave at least where you've got a risk number you're going to get their portfolio information at the end of the meeting or in between meetings so that when you come up for meeting number two you can now kind of kick off with so you said you were a 65. We've analyzed your portfolio. You're an 89. Let's talk about that. Usually yeah. it means there's going to be a change. And so now the change is, well, here's our portfolio. That would be a 65. How do you feel about that? And it, it like it's 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 kind of served itself up for a for an opportunity to close. And as you pointed out, conversely, if 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 they were a 65 and their portfolio is actually a 65, at least now you know there's a different conversation. Like we have to show how we're going to add our value in a different way because fixing your portfolio that's completely out of whack with your risk tolerance actually is not the conversation, but you get to find it out because this is your process integrating risk allies and business developments, not just due diligence after the, after the client closes. Right. And early in my career, I was at a wirehouse and I didn't have kind of the same tools and, and the world has just changed from a fintech st- standpoint anyways in yes. the last 12 years. You know, I, I joke that fintech years are like dog years now. One year it was what well, used to be seven of the last, Yeah, no kidding. Because, which is exciting. And, and, you know, finally we're coming into some really great technology in the financial, financial services industry, which is typically, I think, been behind. But at, at the wirehouse, really what you're doing when you get a prospect is you're trying to prove that your investment management is better because that really wasn't, I mean, I I didn't do a lot of financial planning. I felt like there was a little bit of tool. They had a Monte Carlo analysis, you know, for retirement projections, but it was just a different experience. And I hated it because I felt like I was always living and dying by performance and it didn't feel like a good relationship. I, I really wanted the relationship to be about, you know, me taking care of in their financial life and being a coach and help with investor behavior and things like that. But I, so I guess risk class helped me find something that in that prospecting way, you can have actual conversations because nobody, I don't know many normal people that want someone to sit down for an hour and explain where well, art, my alpha is better, my beta is better, <laughs> you know, your large cap growth position, wow, that's a terrible, you know, check out my sharp company. ratios. Yep. Right. Like, I mean, I just remember watching people nearly die of boredom talking to me and yep. it's like eyes glassed over. And so we don't talk about any of that stuff. I mean, if someone wants to get into it, Matt and I are properly prepared. I mean, right. we know the stuff. It's not like we can't. Yeah, for the like three out of a hundred clients who take the conversation there, because and those are engineers. Yep, yes, because they're engineers, and, <laughs> and they will bring in a prospectus, and that's fine. Yep. But you know, because we can answer those questions, but most people don't want you to lead with that information. So we're really just we're using risk laws. We talk about portfolio behavior. We talk about their behavior. You know, planning recommendations. So it's been a tool that it really moves us away from that you know, what contest of my portfolio is better than the one your guy made for you. And then if it's not in one year, which likely it won't be, you're going to disappoint somebody or the market's going to change on you or, you know, whatever, then you look bad. And when my partner and I started it, we've just been really focused on that not being our value add. 
there's got to be a lot more to what you're bringing to the table. And we've watched that happen in our industry. The investment management's become extremely commoditized, as we all know, and a lot more competition yeah. out there. So, And just that, you know, as you said, the, this ability to have a better conversation than alphas and betas and sharp ratios and details in the prospectus, like that, that to me is, is ultimately why, Risk allies can you know, sell a product at three to five times the price of Finometrica and and outgrow them in the process. That most risk tolerance tools were, you know, it was an overhead cost. Like, okay, I have to check the box for compliance purposes and give them this questionnaire after they become a client before I implement the portfolio to make sure I don't get in trouble with anything. And and risk allies essentially has positioned itself as a as a prospecting business development tool, use this thing well, and you will increase your revenue, and it more than pays for itself. And and I think that's part of what's been what's made Riskalyze able to drive such growth. And and the irony me of so many of their competitors that crop up that that try to come in and say, hey, well, you know, we you know we found a different seventeen question process with new point new data points to analyze to try to give you a better risk score than Riskalyze does, and academically i can debate whether maybe they're right or wrong and that is better but part of what makes riskalyze work so well is like it's not literally about the mechanics of who has the most academically rigorous process to determine whether the client's risk number was supposed to be 65 or 67.239 if we had a better questionnaire it's riskalyze gets a number that you can show visually and connect to people with a conversation and it drives business Right. And I, so Aaron Klein's a good friend of mine, you know, that obviously one of the founders of Riskalyze. And I've told him I'm so proud of his success, but I really hate it because it's going to, it gives me uh, less competitive edge the more advisors that use it. So yeah, I guess that, that used to be a really unique conversation you got to have as a Riskalyze early adopter, slightly less yeah, unique now so. that the other advisor they're talking to may have already put it on their website and put the client through the process. <laughs> right. I was like, you know, as your friend and I've been friends with many people at risk lives, I'm so proud and happy and cheering you on. And I, but as like a user that uses it for competitive reasons, I'm kind of disappointed. Could you be a little <laughs> like, bit less successful? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, but, but back to your point about pricing, I've had this conversation with some friends of mine that are in fintech companies and other advisors at this point, Technology has become such an important tool for us to invest in and to be able to do our jobs for the client, but also from a compliance standpoint. And it's very expensive. I, I can track our, our history of revenue and expenses. And I gratefully say that we've just grown exponentially over the last 10 years in our revenue. But I, we've also grown exponentially in our expenses. And you've watched that technology line item grow and grow and grow, but I don't feel like we've added on a ton of new things. We're still kind of doing things the same way. It's just costing more money. And all of these tools that are coming out, you know, I almost wonder if there's a little bit of a fintech bubble that'll happen because do you need eight to 10 risk type companies? You know, I don't know. And, and the thing is, is I'm not adding anything to my company's technology line item right now, unless I can say it moves the needle. It's either got to for sure help me retain clients or for sure help me bring them on. And if it, I've looked, I've uh, demoed some other stuff and I just can't, even if it's, you know, $99 a month, it's still $1,200 more a year. And, you know, you really have to, as a business owner, watch that bottom line carefully because those expenses tick up we invest a lot in human capital. We we really want the best people. I say rock stars only on board. And, you know, that's where I want to spend money right now, not more widgets for clients, unless it's really going to make an improvement or make sure I'm keeping clients, then I, I just really don't have a justification to bring it on board. You know, we track our PL monthly, we watch our AUM every week, we track every platform. And I'm big on metrics and I've just painfully watched it grow, but thankfully our revenue has too. But <laughs> so are there other tools that you use in the in the prospecting business development process that are that play a big role as well? Or is is risk as kind of the driver beyond just the usual, you know, you, you need something to analyze and slice and dice the portfolio a bit just to understand what they've got so you can communicate back to them what you're gonna do that's different. 
Yeah, I kind of joke that e-money and risk lies are my one-two punch. You know, we're we're really leading with planning, and that's where we start with in, in that meeting. And then the second part is going to be the, the portfolio conversation. You know, I also use e-money interactively on the screen. So we'll use the decision center or we'll just have their, you know, total assets up on the screen. Or, you know, we dim, we demo the client website to show them this is this is a tool that we have available. So you're actually doing this when they're still a prospect, not necessarily waiting until they've come on board with the client to, to start showing e-money? Yes. Interesting. Interesting. And for a while, e-money, the only thing you could put in, it's new client. And my feedback for years was, you know, what they told me is it's not typical that people would put them in, which I didn't realize early. It's after the fact, and then they're in their client system. So we did it the opposite because now they're hiring us for financial planning. So I guess that's why we're putting them in the system, but we're considering them an investment management prospect. And so now they have an option where you can put in lead. Okay. So we can keep that separate and then we'll convert them to client once they come on board as an investment management client. Interesting. And so you'll, so even early on, like, are you gathering data to start populating e-money while they're still a prospect or you're just setting up and entering a few data points as they go, or you're just showing them a sample portal just so they can see like, Hey, if you worked with us, this would be the dashboard that you would see. How does it actually pull in? Yeah. So the first meeting, usually when our clients come in, the meeting has been set. So we don't do any seminar. We do no cold marketing at all. We do social media, but we do no cold marketing. So our, our typical prospect is referred calls or emails in, makes the appointment. Most of the people I walk into for a meeting, I've never seen in my life. I know the person that sent them there. So by the time they're in the conference room, they know who we are, what we do, and what the process is, because that's already been established in the appointment setting. Okay. And then we will either have a phone or in person if if we want to just, because we don't take everybody and we have a very clear who we work with. And so when we go into that first meeting, Usually we've kind of chatted on the phone and or and then I follow up with an email with here's our financial plan cost and what you get for it. So in that first meeting, 99% of the time we're taking all of their data. They're coming with statements and information and we get our arms around all of their personal financial situation and what their goals are. So it's a very involved meeting. And then I take all of their data, put it into eMoney once they confirm, you know, they've confirmed with us and signed the contract that we're going to do the planning and we figure out what type of planning they need. And then I put everything they currently have in e-money and then run plans and reports from that, that we then in the second meeting will use on screen interactively. Okay. Wait, so does that mean essentially the, like the, the, the prospect meeting to decide if you're going to work with them is also effectively the data gathering meeting for e-money in the first place, or are these separate meetings, there's a prospecting process and they say they're coming on board and then you do a data gathering meeting to get the data that's going to go any money. We give them the option. So we say sometimes they're coming, they, they really do know exactly what we do. And they've talked to their best friend who told them, Hey, it's this amount of money for the financial. This. So when they set the appointment, they say, no, we're good. Yeah. We're definitely moving forward unless something crazy you know happens. So usually if they've called or emailed in, we say, hey, yes, would you like to get on a call just to make sure we're a good fit and we can do exactly what you need us to, do, you know, we're what you're looking for, or we can do like a 30 minute in-person meeting and just make sure that that's what we're looking for. We do that one way or the other. A lot of times we try to do it on a call because we don't want to waste our time and we don't want to waste theirs. And we can pretty quickly determine if we're the right fit or not. I was referred someone recently and in the email where she referred me, it was basically, she will, you know, she will do this. This will be handled for you. They're wonderful. It was very nice. I was reading the email like, I am not doing that. I will not do that. Yeah. Oh, you've kind of overpromised me, but thank you. Very loyal client who thank I appreciate. And, and what, <laughs> yeah. And what it was, it, it was a nonprofit organization in another city that needed said they wanted a 401k plan, but had two employees that made like a little bit of money. And it's just not a fit for us. And so what I did though, is I said, Hey, let's get on a call, which he was out of town. So he wasn't going to go in person, but I had done this either way. You know, let's get on a call. And in 10 minutes, and I Googled where he lived. I looked into some advisors and I gave him, I said, look, based on where you live, 
here are three names of firms that look pretty reputable. I can't really make the recommendation. I don't know these people, but I've done broker check and I've looked into them. I think that's a better option for you to start. It's really not our business model. And, you know, so you hate to do that. And I let the person referring, I said, hey, I helped him out. I definitely wanted to do that. But that particular situation just wasn't a fit for us. But I appreciate you thinking of me. So, (laughs) you know, we, you try to weed that out on the phone. And and I, I know that might be different. I think some people just really want to grow their business. And it's not that we don't, but we've been, we've been intentional. We've turned away clients that have millions of dollars that, they want a stock picker. That's not what we do. Or they were rude and adios. You're not going to be rude to me and my staff. So yeah, I think there's a there's a powerful effect there that if you have not if you do not on regular occasion refer a prospect to another advisor, you probably aren't focused enough in who you're serving. You're probably that's saying a great yeah, point. you're probably saying yes to to too many people, or or you just have a marketing problem. You're literally, literally not talking to anybody new. That's maybe a little, a little bit of a different problem. <laughs> right. But if problem, if you're yeah. if you're regularly talking to prospects and you're working with all of them, you're almost certainly not not focused. Like it's one of the trends that I've seen or observed over the years that when I talk to advisors that are having good growth and successful growth, one of the things that I find is they often identify clients that aren't the right and best fit for them and just refer them somewhere else. Like it came to you. It sort of feels good of like, I do want to help this person get somewhere and not, not send them out into the wind to get abused by whatever random salesperson happens to reach them. Right. Yeah. And after that call, I walked out of my office and told Adam that works with me. I said, I'm so glad I am mature enough in my professional life that I'm just fine doing that because there was a time when I had either sales goals or just really wanted to help anybody that came along that I would have, I would take any business very early in my career. But then I quickly realized it's just long-term. That's a really tough way to, to grow your, your company. Well, eventually you hit a ceiling because you, you're at capacity with all the people that you can serve. You can't add any more clients and you can't really grow and many of your clients are not actually a good fit. And so you just get stuck. And you're always doing different things. I mean, even though we do a wide amount of things, we're doing those every day for kind of the same. I mean, I could, I could literally draw, you know, like a cartoon character of each of these three types of clients and be like, you know, name 50 people that fall behind that exact profile pretty much. And so when, when we identify that, we know their needs and especially young professionals. My partner and I are living the same life. You know, new mom sits down with me and, you know, we just start talking and, and there's a connection there. So a lot of benefit that, of that too is a male-female partnership. We're in pretty mm-hmm. much every meeting together for sure on the prospecting side. Harder to do it as we grow on every client meeting, but we kind of figure out that as we go. But but yeah, I mean, you just can't take everybody and think that you're going to have a business that you love 10 years down the road. That's such a good way to put you. You can't take everybody. How do you say it? you can't take everybody you meet and have a business you're going to love 10 years down the road? Yeah. 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 So once people come on board, help me understand the the process of you're doing data gathering, you're doing a plan. At some point they get invested. It sounds like you charge for the plan and they're also going to do investment management. There may be some other products you implement. Like how, how does this flow out from here? Is it uh, just a you know, data gathering meeting, a plan presentation meeting and an implementation meeting? How does it work for you? Yeah. So after we decide together what the plan is going to be. So for one section of our business, which is going to be the younger the asset gatherers, right? So they're they're building their assets. So we're making a recommendation on cash on hand. We find a lot of them are cash heavy because they probably, based on age or experience, haven't worked a lot with an advisor and they may have had a 401k rollover or something, but they haven't gotten into like brokerage savings yet. Some have, some haven't, but generally speaking, so we're looking at cash on hand, what's the appropriate amount? We'll give a range that we think and we talk about that together and make that determination. They keep that in a money market for themselves. Then we determine what allocation to a brokerage account and then what monthly contribution we're going to make to that. Most of our clients don't qualify for Roth IRAs. Because income is too high. 
Yeah. yeah, just the household income's too high. So once in a while we'll see that, but usually not. And then pretty frequently we're doing college planning. So we're going to make a recommendation on initial funding and then monthly funding. If they have a 401k plan at their business or whatever they have going on at their business, we're usually evaluating, are they taking, you know, maximum benefit of all that. So we'll look at their W-2 statement because someone telling me that they're in their 401k at whatever percent, maybe, <laughs> are you? Because I find they don't actually go look or right. something got adjusted and they didn't know. And I had, we have an OBGYN client that ha- has very high income. And she said, I'm in my 401k. But when I looked at her W-2, she was in the Roth part and therefore not taking advantage mm. of the income deduction there that she thought she was. So really looking at all of those things, we usually are doing a life insurance analysis or recommendation for new. We don't typically use whole life, but we're using different types of permanent policies and then term policies. We we just believe whatever is the right fit for the client, that that's what we like to use. And whatever the preference is with the client, we like to talk about the differences. And that's going to be your younger couples. So when we're onboarding, that's all the paperwork that comes along with that, you know, there's a meeting for that. And then from there, it passes to Adam where he takes that onboarding relationship from there and brings me in. And if there's a question, but he'll go to me and Matt, but usually he's just handling the the actual account setup process, getting them in the e-money, keeping them informed along the way, you know, confirming transfers and getting them into red tails, what we use is our CRM. So that process, and then After three months, they get a client commitment card. We've implemented this this year, client service commitment card. And that's just outlining, okay, annually, we're going to meet in the first and third quarter. Here's what we're doing for you in the meantime. Here's our office hours. You know, don't text me for advice or, you know, just kind of our housekeeping rules, sort of. We're closed these holidays. So they get that in three months. And then usually by six months, we're meeting again. Or we follow that schedule that we established either first and third quarter, second and fourth quarter, or, or just once a year. So that's kind of the ongoing process. I like I like that. A, a, a client service commitment card, literally a card. or It's like a little a, postcard. Yeah, it goes in an envelope, like the size of an invitation you'd get in the mail. Okay. They can stick it in, on their fridge. Okay. Just, you know. Just so you remember, here's, here's here's the best way to work with us, reach us, when you can reach us, how you reach us, what we're committing to do. Yeah, and I, my, my thought for that was maybe they'll put it on a bulletin board or, you know, on yeah. the fridge and maybe a neighbor comes over and sees that and says, you know, that's different. Tell me, you know, oh, you have a schedule or, you know, trying to trying to run it almost like more like a dental office, you know, your, your, your check-ins are, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your check-ins are this, send them out, send them out with the car to remind them of when their next visit is due. And yeah. And we have it in our system where it alerts us that it's time, you know, for the next one. Cause we put in the meeting notes, upload all the documents that went with it, and then it'll trigger us, in, you know, whatever month we say. And then we, you know, Adam reaches out or whoever is responsible at that time for reaching out to make the appointment, do the reminder, and then they come in. And and what's the CRM system you guys build around? Redtail. Okay, Redtail. So, so how does this all work from the the business model end? You know, you you mentioned early on you're about ninety million dollars of of assets under management, but you've mentioned planning fees. And doing investment management, and there's some insurance that may get implemented as well, which is obviously a commission outside the traditional AUM structure. So, like, what does this look like from a business model perspective? Like, what do you charge for the planning and the investment management? And how do you handle the commissions mixed in for clients who might have already done planning and investment management? Talk to us about what that looks like. Yeah, I'm probably, you know, I get some usually kind of pushback or surprise on our, on the way we charge, but it is what it is. We all do it differently, it seems to be. But so when they do the plan and and they pretty much have to do the plan onboarding, that's just what we believe in. And so we're pretty low, in my opinion, on the planning fees, the basic plan, and that's probably going to get changed. But the basic plan is $500 and the retirement income planning is $1,500. And those are kind of our two client profiles. Once they're on board as a client, unless something changes like retirement or we're starting totally new, with a major event, then we're we're not going to charge the planning fee again. That's just kind of an onboarding. We want to do it. And we consider it part of our just ongoing process with them as keeping that plan in place, unless there's, a, again, a major adjustment where we start over a divorce or 
usually retirement business sell something like that. Right. But conversely, our our asset management fees are probably on the higher side than what you see in the RIA world. But we do a lot more than some of the typical just RIA investment management companies. So our fee schedule is tiered. And it's also all in. So if we have a manager on the on the account, that's not a separate charge. Does that make sense? So yeah, yeah. So if you if you're using a separately managed account for something like that's going to come out of your fee, that's not in addition to your fee. Exactly, and all platform fees come out of that. So if there's any, so basically we will. I don't like the nickel and dime approach. I want to say your your cost is going to be X, and they know that, and there's no surprises outside okay. of that. So it starts at 1.5% from zero to $250,000. 250 to 2 million is 1.25. 2 million to five is 0.75. And over 5 million, we pretty much keep, we do have clients over 5 million and we pretty much have kept them at 0.75. All right. So, you know, similar, but negotiable, maybe <laughs> at 5 million plus if, if it seems appropriate in the meeting. Yeah, and we usually are competitive with what they've been paying, so it's not really – like we're kind of matching right. it, so it's not really been an issue. And the largest client we have has around $20 million with us. So our net worth ranges quite a bit in our practice too for our clients. But So some people think that's very high, but what we actually net is around the 1% that most advisors charge. Yeah, well, and and – from the pure top line advisory fee perspective, yeah, it's it's at least a bit higher than the classic, you know, one percent on a million that's sort of out there as the benchmark. But you know, there was a study a year or two ago that Bob Veers's Inf- Inside Information did that we wrote up on the on the site as well about like typical all in fees for advisors. By the time you layer in, you know, the platform fees and the trading fees and other manager fees and like all the other things that you've just integrated into your fee in the first place. And by the time you grab all those all-in fees and and put it in, what you find is, well, actually, median fee is pretty much one and a half percent in a million dollars. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's where we we just priced it a little differently. But we actually, when people say you're high, I'm like, but that's not. I don't get all of that. That's not all to me. I've got to pay. You know. Yeah. Other people get a piece of that pie. I just I found it a very just annoying, frankly. I, I don't like to be nickel and dimed. I like to be very clear on what I'm what I'm paying for and what I'm getting out of it. So I didn't like the, you know, my fee is 1%, platform form fee is 0.25, then the manager gets 0.25. It's like, I don't think they care. They're paying X. Well, and, and there's a powerful effect that comes from it that at least as long as your all-in fee, you know, adds up competitively, which I, I think it does if you look at the industry data around all in fees like your 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 numbers are still in line but you know it, it provides i think some some rather powerful positive incentives for the client and and from the client's perspective of you know when it comes out of your pocket you're going to look really hard at whether that manager really justifies their fee cuz it literally comes out of your pocket to and justify <laughs> the value proposition to the to the clients like you're you're not selling a manager you're selling your value and you can pick a manager that you think delivers value, but they darn well better because you really notice when it comes out of your pocket. Ideally, we'd notice when it comes out of the client's pocket, but it's nothing quite like focusing the attention by literally paying that those additional fee layers out of your own pocket and then taking a hard look at whether they're creating value in the stack. Right, exactly. We, we joke with people, we want everybody to get to $5 million. I'd be, I would be ecstatic if every one of our clients gets to 5 million because everybody's one. Yep. <laughs> you know? And then we also talk about why we charge the way we do. We, we genuinely believe that we want our clients to know that every action we take is in their best interest. And our values and goals are all aligned in the same and that we don't want our portfolio. And again, we manage most, most of them in house. So we don't want our portfolios to go down. Our company revenue goes down. Right. We want our portfolios to grow. Our company revenue grows. Well, that means our clients are making more money. So, you know, we're not making a trade because, and then they've got to pay, you know, these trading costs if there's some on platforms or whatever. We're genuinely making a trade because we don't want, we believe that that's the best interest for everybody. So like, you know, in those early client meetings this year, I said, look, nobody was more worried about the markets than we were. Right. Or I said upset about the market. Sorry, not in a way that our clients wouldn't be 
taken care of, it's like we knew our portfolios, we made trades and we did make adjustments and we took an opportunity for tax loss harvesting. So, mm-hmm. you know, it was good. But I said, I, t- I took a pay cut in January, you know, you know, and that was the sad part for me. I'm, you know, I'm watching it going, man. But so we're doing everything we can to protect the portfolios, but we're really looking long-term, you know, we, we knew it would be all right, but. So, so now I do have to ask from kind of this best interest framing and alignment perspective, but you do have some insurance-based commission products in in the mix as well of what you're implementing, as well as I'm assuming some of the REITs and BDCs probably don't fit into the traditional advisory accounts or have some separate compensation. They do. So how do you how do you explain this or reconcile this for the client that that says like, wait, you like you're saying you're going to act to my best interest, but you're still selling these commission based products, and and not that those have to be equal or opposite, but you know certainly the media has framed them that way. <laughs> yes, and and I and I just don't I, I don't get on board with that conversation. I mean, I I think that because you get paid a commission, I don't think that makes you a bad person or have done the wrong thing. I think that we di- haven't had a choice. I do not have a choice. The insurance industry chooses how to compensate me. I do not. You know, I'm not going to refer out that business because I believe I do it better than just an insurance salesperson because I don't need that sale to pay my bills this month. I need the client to be happy and taken care of for life. And we give them options and we talk through that conversation. We talk and we say, you know, we can't help how the insurance company pays us. That's separate from investment management. That's not necessarily the same thing either. So So kind of separate, separate service, separate thing, like. It just it it is what it is. I'm going to do the work to implement it for you, and here's how the insurance company does the compensation. Yeah, so we you know we tell them, and that the insurance industry has always been that way. It's not something new. And I think most people, if they've had it, you know, if if they're any kind of awareness of the insurance industry, they know insurance agents get paid commissions, whether you're car insurance or any type of insurance. So that's not any big conversation or surprise. The alternative investments, more and more companies, you know, that that industry really kind of had an upheaval. And the alternative investment companies have really, a lot of them restructured so that we can now put some of them in our advisory portfolios. So we do. So they're, they're restructuring with advisory advisory class options. Right. They have different share class options now and have ways that they've they've created from a legal standpoint or, or the regulations, you know, to, to value them and things like that so that they can be in the advisory portfolios. Things that are still commission based, we talk about it, but also if I have, you know, I say if you've got fifty thousand dollars in this brokerage account that I'm making annual, you know, money on for five years. Or we take fifty thousand dollars and put it into a, you know, direct placement program or some type of thing like that. Like we're doing a real estate development right now, and I get an upfront commission, but I'm I'm not paid on it ever again. And and the hold is five years. Is there? Does that matter to you? Is that important to you? And most people go, no, I don't really care because they've already because that, they trust you. Right. Well, I'm getting paid on the fifty thousand either way. Right. Because it's, right. it's either going to be an advisory. So I'm not necessarily and the upfront commissions have come down on the products that we use. And I think across the board. But what we're not doing is doing a lot of upfront commission work in like mutual funds or other types of things. And the people that are investing in the alternative investments, most of them are accredited investors. I mean, we, we work with a lot of highly you know, well-educated, savvy professionals. Right. They just want a good investment. And, you know, not, not all of them have worked out great oil and natural gas deals. That's, that's just, again, something that that's invested. They get the royalties for, for the life of the well and that they're in that product, but we're not, they know we're not paid on going on it. It's just that one time thing. But if they're saving a hundred thousand dollars, I mean, we've had clients, you know, pretty significant amounts of money there that they don't, they truly don't need. They prefer the tax savings. They don't care how we're compensated. They're glad we're compensated. They want us to do well. So I haven't seen it. At, you know, I, I I think that the bad guys out there that the media are talking about are the ones that are, you know, you've got a 60-year-old that has a $500,000 rollover and it's put, in, and I've seen this a lot and it angers me and they're put straight into one annuity that they can never get out of and the person's paid up front and never speaks to them again. Right. Those are people that I don't think are acting in best interest of anybody but themselves. One well, and to me, like that to me has always been the essence of my 
my challenge or concern around around the annuity domain is, as you pointed out, like, well, it's sort of the simplest case. Like, look, I can charge, you know, I can get paid a 5% commission up front for a five year hold, or I can charge you per 1% a year for the next five years. Like, the math is going to add up the same. I can already either charge right. you five times one or one times five, but you know, my, my compensation, to the advisor is going to be similar. The, the challenge though, is, you know, if I want to get paid 1% a year for five years on this client, I actually have to keep doing things for five years. Otherwise at some point by years four or three, or possibly even two, if I haven't done anything, this client may well go somewhere else because I'm, I'm not doing anything on an ongoing basis to justify the fee. And, if I get paid all five up front, frankly, I have an incentive to not bother calling them again for five years because the money's already tied up and I'll use the intervening four years to call in other new people I can do business with. And and just it 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 doesn't have the same incentives around ongoing service support. Like that that to me is just one of the challenges of the dynamic, much less so in a model like yours, because you're also doing ongoing business with them and ongoing planning and ongoing investment management. And so you don't you don't really right. have that like do the business and walk away like the standalone annuity agent that you were talking about because this is just a this may just be a small slice of an overall portfolio allocation. Yeah, and it's always a slice. So the 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 bulk of the relationship is going to be the investment management and the portfolios. That's only I mean in c- compliance we, we couldn't even Yeah, do yeah, yeah, they were, compliance won't let you do 90% to BDCs or anything. Right. <laughs> I mean and whoever would want to, yeah. crazy. but um, no. but so you know it's a ten to twenty percent allocation, and again, it's it's a much larger portfolio usually. So it's people that also want diversification, they want uncorrelated assets, and they want interesting ideas. You know, a lot of times if if we were just doing index funds and not adding value anywhere, I'm not saying you can. I'm not saying only index funds, but you see what I mean. Like we're we're coming to the table with different ideas. Sometimes people understand real estate better. Than others, and so that's something they get excited about and think it's neat, or you know whatever the case may be. But we're not doing it for everybody, and it's only going to be a small allocation of the overall portfolio that we're managing, and only if it's an investment that we think is a good deal. Because at the end of the day, if if after five years we have egg on our face from that client's not doing another one, or they might not want to work with us anymore, and then the majority of our assets that we make our money on on an annual revenue basis are really in in the managed portfolio. So we don't want to lose that. So we do a lot of due diligence around these products. We don't place people in them lightly. We've usually spent a lot of time with the company first to really understand the product, understand the handful of people it might fit for. And then that's it. But, and as far as the business model, revenue wise, about 70% of our income is going to be from company revenue is from AUM, you know, as far as our asset management fees. So, I mean, insurance this year, we've really killed it with insurance. We've made $721, (laughs) 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 you know, so it depends on the year, but I mean, our our insurance, we're we're not, we're not insurance brokers, but we do believe in it. So it's going to be about 10% of our revenue and our five to 10 ish, and then direct product or or commission-based products. And that includes 401k plans, and profit sharing plans and cash balance plans that we manage as well. That's going to be 10 to 15. Th- those are all going to range per year. Between 70 and 80% of our annual revenue is always coming from our portfolio management and everything else is an ancillary part of a bigger relationship. We, we don't, even someone, if they just wanted a life insurance policy, it would depend on whether or not we would even help them out. I might find a really good insurance person to help them. So is that revenue mix shifting over time as well, like as more of the product, as more as the available product mix goes advisory than commission based, is that percentage that's on the AUM side versus the commission side shifting for you? Well, that's only been in the last year. So I'm interested to see yeah. how that changes. Only in the last year that we've put them in okay. advisory accounts. I, I know that we were kind of watching to see how that shook right. out before we started doing it. And also, Share classes had to be approved by our broker dealer before we could implement some. So there was a little time lag there, but we definitely saw a change in the numbers where we did not do as many direct products when the kind of when they were changing the regulations and changing share classes. We just kind of said, you know, 
just kind of sit back and wait on this. And we didn't have as many products that we were that interested in at that time. And so a lot of the alternative investment companies had pulled back or not had products available. So we just kind of sat there, but I, I don't, I think we'll continue to do that model. I prefer that. I would say, yes, I think probably that number will shift. I don't really know how drastically, how quickly we'll have to see. And so, so from the flip side, well, as I guess, yes, like who's, who's your broker dealer that you're, you're under in the first place? So I'm affiliated with Triad Advisors. That's one of the five I, IABs with Ladenburg Thalman. Okay. And, and under Triad, because you're doing all this advisory business, are you, are you part of their corporate REA? Are you a outside REA, but you place the brokerage business with them for the portion that has to be through a broker dealer? What's that structure? We are under their corporate RIA. Okay. Okay. So you're dual registered under their corporate RIA. And so as you look at this trend, like I'm, I'm just curious, I've seen this from so many advisors under the hybrid environment that as product mix becomes more advisory oriented. And so revenue mix becomes more and more advisory over time. Like, do you see yourself with the broker dealer in the long run? Do you see some point where the commission based portion comes down so much you say it's just not worth it like how do you vision the future of your business as a as a dual registered advisor now i i don't envision us we'll we'll see if i listen to this podcast in 10 years how i feel about <laughs> this con- about this con- i i would be very surprised if we ever dropped our broker dealer relationship because the value there is not just oh you know I can process commissions for commission-based business through these people. We are with an, a broker dealer that we have a, a real, we get a lot of value from. I, I would prefer to use their compliance department than outsource somewhere else or build my own. They're very easy to work with. There's a lot of knowledge base that we get. And well, that's you don't hear a lot of people are like, I like my broker dealer's compliance department. That's I know. <laughs> It's an interesting testimonial for for Triad or any BD. Not testimonial. We don't want to get you in trouble. But you know, like I guess you can testimonial them. You just your clients can't testimonial you. But oh, okay, is that the rule? I get nervous around that word. No, but so yeah, we genuinely get a lot of value from them. So yeah, and I think they're unique in the business. So and I, I tell people when we were looking for broker dealers, the consistent response was I love them, and that was you don't hear. But I'm like, no, really, why? no, so. So for all those who are at broker dealers, they hate and can't stand their compliance department. This is episode 136. So if you go to <laughs> kitsis.com slash 136, we'll have a link out to try it because I'm going to guess some people are going to want to call them after your, <laughs> after the way you're describing them. It's definitely, again, do, do not hear a lot of, I really like my broker dealer's compliance department and would happily choose them over an outsourced alternative. That does not come up very often. <laughs> Yeah, at the executive leadership team, the advisory department. I mean, they're all, you know, I couldn't rehire that. And I, and I'd, I think I'd have a very hard time re- replacing it outsourced. And the payout is extremely fair. And I've been very happy with that. So, I mean, I, I think if you have a bad relationship, that then, yeah, you, you should probably consider that. But if you if we feel we're getting value for, for what we're paying and the commission-based things, as long as they are in the world that they're in and not able to go in advisory, then I just, because like oil and natural gas deals, or we'll see whatever happens with opportunity zones. I don't, I don't know if we'll do that, but we're looking at it. I just would be surprised those ever being advisory type products because they're hard to value consistently. they are tools that we're not willing to give up. So is kind of my opinion as well at this point, but I, I do get a lot of pushback in the industry on why we're not our own RIA or why we still have a BD relationship. So, so talk to us about, the journey through the industry that you've had in the in the first place. How did how did you get started? Like, were you a financial planning undergrad? Got your CFP in school, came straight into the industry, or did you career change in later? Like, what's been your journey down the advisor road? Oh, I'm an accidental advisor that's made a series of happy mistakes. Is a way to sum up um, <laughs> my like career. <laughs> an accidental advisor who's made a series of happy mistakes. Happy mistakes. So I I started in New York City in fashion PR in 2003. I graduated from UNC Chapel Hill as an English major, creative writing minor. I had already published one book and was taking the world by storm, in my opinion, as a naive 22-year-old. 
and, and moved to New York and realized after about a year that industry really wasn't for me and had a lot of friends that worked on Wall Street. And I did some pre- pretty cool stuff in fashion PR. That's uh, an experience I'm glad I had, it, but I realized I just didn't want to continue a career in, in that way. Well, it's nice to have the opportunity to get the experience to go, I just figured out something I totally do not want to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> yes. And so I tell, yeah, I tell college graduates all the time, go get a job if it's a good opportunity, but you may find out what you don't want to do, which is what I did. And, and then pivoted to something I never thought I would do. I hate math. I love people and relationships. And, and now I understand the industry more and I'm, I, I love what I do. So I quit that job, got in touch with a recruiter, short temp job in an Australian investment bank and went back to her and said, yes, I love this place me. That was the end of 2004. So that was like the last quarter of 2004. And then I said, by January 1st, I really want a permanent position in finance. So I started working with an institutional asset manager and was the liaison between the client and the firm managing 80 client relationships representing $89 billion in AUM. Oh, holy cow. Okay. Yeah. And never thought I would be in finance, period. I I had never had the self-confidence as a girl in rural Eastern North Carolina. I didn't even know what a financial advisor was. I thought maybe I could be somebody's secretary possibly, but, and I found myself at, you know, early twenties working on wall street and I'm like, holy crap. And I really genuinely loved it. But I, after, so then in 2006, I'd been in New York for three years and was kind of burned out, really wanted to move back to North Carolina to be closer to family. And I got an opportunity at a wirehouse to be an advisor. And so in 06, I went to the retail side and found that I really loved it, but I was there from 06, 07. So which wirehouse did you, did you end out with? So I was with Merrill Lynch okay. in their Durham, North Carolina office. I lived in Raleigh, but I commuted. That was where I had an opportunity. And I was in their training program very well, defeating every odd that there is for a young female on her own at at that point, 25 years old and doing well, meeting my hurdles. I started, I cold called one day and decided that that was terrible and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Knew that that wasn't what I wanted to do. So I created a different strategy where one, I knew I'm better face to face and I really like to present and educate people. So I started trying to speak to women's networking groups and formed a couple of my own. And I started cold walking or I called it cold stalking. And so I would do a lot of research on a business and a business owner, print their 5,500 and, but I went to areas that were less served. So I would go right outside of Durham or Raleigh to some of the more suburb areas that might only have a couple of advisors in the area or less competition because Raleigh and Durham have a lot. And so I would go into these offices and just say, hi, I have printed some information about your company that I would love to discuss and highlight a couple of things on the 5500 mention some regulation change in the 401k space. So form 5500s are the the public reporting form that goes to Department of Labor for anybody that's got a sizable qualified plan and it's and it's public information. So you can you can find 401k plan business owners and and some information about their plan, at least a little bit of information about them by pulling the 5500s and then figuring out who you want to call on with which is cool from a prospecting perspective, but tough because it's public data. So everyone Everybody, else has yeah. it as well, which right. is why you went to some more rural suburbs where there maybe were going to be fewer people who pulled that 5,500 to call on those same business owners. Right. I, I thought, you know, I've got to get smart because I statistically probably won't make it. So I had to find ways to get <laughs> a little depressing, <laughs> but kind of given that message in that environment too consistently. But so, you know, I was constantly told I needed gray hair at the table. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say this year I, I got my first two gray hairs after 15 years and, and, you know, many being an advisor and running my own business, I haven't needed gray hair at the table. But so I thought I've got to get smarter. I'm going to lose my job. I'm not going to make my hurdles. So I thought, how can I give myself more information off the bat and decrease my competition? And so that's what I did and get in front of more people. And so it worked. I was doing really well. And then Bank of America bought, you know, the financial crisis happened. It became harder. I became very depressed. It was a very difficult job. Got engaged and found out like a week later that they terminated my training program as of December 31st, 2008. And you were, and you were still in it because you, you weren't through the three-year window yet. Right. So that, I think I would have been up in, March or May, somewhere in there. It would have been the next year. Okay. So fast forward to during the time I was at Merrill, I had been 
friendly competitors with my current business partner. I've always really loved getting advisors together. I love collaborating. I love, I don't consider competition because I believe, I know this is your mentality too. I think sharing and learning together, it makes our industry better and it makes, you know, there's plenty of money to go around. And so he and I had coffee periodically and had gotten to know each other and he was already independent. So we ran into each other after I left Merrill and I, I really wanted to be out of the business. And he was like, no way that cannot happen. I can't see another young person. I can't see another female. He's like, God, you were so good at it. And you, you were so passionate about it. Right. And I was like, no, it's terrible. I hate it. <laughs> and I said, I just, I'm over the corporate mentality. I, I got really beaten down. I'm very, uninterested in, in this business. It, I don't, I don't like it. I, I don't think it takes care of the clients. And he said, no, this side's different and, and not all, not everybody's. And I said, I know not everybody's a bad guy, but it just, I, at the, the time I was really down and he said, well, if you could do anything, what would you want to do? And I responded, I want to do the right thing for the right reason all the time. Not because I need to make production requirements or the client might, you know, be too scared. So I just send them to cash because I don't know how to handle it or whatever. And I want to be a business owner and really help business owners. And he said, that's what I already do. Work with me. And in 20 minutes, I said, okay. And we've been together for 10 years. So so, so was Matt, I think you'd said, he, like, he was he originally in the Merrill program with you? So just he had broken away and gone independent a little bit earlier. And then when your training program got terminated, suddenly you're in conversation to go out and join him? No, Matt has been independent all along. Okay. He okay. had started his own, when I say started his own firm, he, he left, a, a, I think, a group of other guys and went on his own, but he was always independent. Okay. And so he had an assistant at the time and himself. And so we decided to partner. And my, my thing, and our partnership's been unique. I've had a lot of people ask what made it successful, what kind of how does that work financially? And so from day one, we did not revenue share. His book was his book. My book was mine. I didn't have many assets I could bring over from Merrill just because of what was going on at the time and some of the proprietary things. And and honestly, I didn't have the confidence yet to go back to my old clients. I felt bad about what had happened. And Right. There is an awkwardness of like, why did you change firms? Oh, well, I was still a trainee and they wouldn't even keep me as a trainee. Like Right. And then I have this brand that you've never heard of and the senior partners are, you know, 28 and 32. <laughs> yeah. So we really, I worked hard to, what is our, and I think, because I think, you know, when I say happy mistakes at the time, I was devastated by that because I'd worked hard at Merrill. I, I built a book of business, did well, and I was very proud of myself. And then I felt like I just was on the chopping block. And I've always said, I'll never cry for something that can't cry for me back again. You know, I, I felt devoted to them and then felt just got axed, but you know, mature me knows that that wasn't the case. Nobody hated me or right. it was, it was a corporate decision. Say, you just got corporated. I got corporated. And so again, a happy mistake, or if you want to call it a mistake or, or, or you know, the hindsight's 2020. So grateful for that and built a vision over 10 years of, of exactly what we wanted. And, and that's gone well. So I think that put a fire under me to, I no longer had the, the Merrill value add from the brand and the resources. I needed to make sure, I needed to make sure that we did. And so I spent time working really hard on systematizing everything operationally efficiencies. At the time he was less advisory from day one, I said, we're, we're, advi- we're an advisory business. We will do the commission stuff that we have to, but we, ne- we need to be an advisory focused business. So starting to transition that conversation and then starting to build through mostly through networking groups and presentations to current clients event. We, we, in the early years did 10, I mean, 10 would be low. We, we, we did 10 to 25 events a year more than we had the money for, but we had some, some support, but that's how we built. We really believed that both of us providing education and being face-to-face was the way that we best operated. And we wanted to create a business that fueled itself. We didn't want to always feel like we were in a sales role all day long. And so intentionally created that ideal client type, the type of revenue that we wanted, how do we make sure that we can annualize that and, and, budget from that? And then how do we create centers of influences and referral partners so that the engine feeds itself? And we did that. And so that's where I was saying people are referred, they call in. I've 
likely not met them before unless they attended an event or were in a networking group. But that's been delightful because I don't, I, we don't, we don't have a business where that, you know, we're constantly trying to figure out, you know, we got to get a referral. We got to get a referral. We track them every week, but we bring on about 20 new households a year. Okay. So, so I got to ask in the, in more recent months, you've gotten into, I guess, kind of a, a new category and direction of stuff. So you did this, the juggle is real program with, with investment <laughs> news. So for those maybe who are listening and haven't seen it, can you, can you talk about what this, this was or what this is? Yes. So for years, I've really kind of been vocal about my struggle as a, as a young mom building an advisory business or just a working mom in general and two working parents. And so I would use this hashtag on social media and I'm very active on social media called the juggle is real. And a lot of it was putting out my bad days and just the, oh my gosh, moments, it not all being a shiny picture every day. And I, I'd have people say, I, I remember a text message I got from a friend that said, man, you really have it all together. How do you do all of these things? She was pregnant at the time. And she said, you know, you're like, uh, you've got these amazing kids and all these things and you have this and that. She's like, but you're very real about it. And I was like, I don't have it all together. I'm literally crying right now receiving this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in shambles. So I really appreciate this. But like, my, I had a bad night with a sick kid and I've got this big presentation tonight and I don't feel prepared. And so it's funny. And, I, and I, I've had other working parents over the years come up to me and say, your posts are hilarious. And like, I feel like I know your kids and like, you're, you're just very real. And the juggle is real was just a tongue in cheek on the struggle is real because mine, I don't. It's a struggle, sure, but more than anything, it's a juggle. It's just the the working parents having to always feel like they've got to be, you know, somewhere else or, or feel pulled. And so Matt Ackerman and I, so Matt Ackerman, for those that don't know, is one of the most wonderful people. He is the just nicest guy. And we had had a relationship at Investment News where we did a different video series together and had always said we'd love to film together again. We just had a blast. And he and I like, we think the same way, I think a lot with some of the production. And we ran into each other in Florida at a conference and we started talking and he said, I'd love to do The Juggle is Real. I just don't know if I can get it done at investment news. And so fast forward to September, October, I got a text message from him and he said, Hey, if I could film you in New York next month, could you do it? And I said, I said, absolutely. Let's, <laughs> let's do this thing. And so, well, well, I wasn't really ready to drop everything to come to New York next month, but Hey, the juggle is real. So the juggle is real. I got it. And yeah. Make it happen. Yeah. And so he said, investment news gave him the green light and then, Triad came on board as a sponsor and our, our goal really with it. And, and we want to take it to another series. We're, we're ta- discussing that right now, series two. And the goal is to really kind of highlight a struggle or, you know, a, a situation that happened to me or may have happened to someone else. We'll probably expand it a little bit. And then kind of the funny out of it that I'm able to see now. And then, you know, what it taught me or, you know, whether it's mom hacks or like life lessons that in those moments probably didn't feel like they were a life lesson. They felt like a bad day or, you know, time, but yeah. And really the message being, I felt very lonely through a lot of my career being a female advisor. And that goes to the female advisor network. All of this was, has been happening all at the same time, both with really the same intention of creating a message in different ways, obviously, but that you're not by yourself and that I don't care what anybody puts on social media. Nobody has all good days. You know, there's yeah. no 365 good days. Yeah. And and if there are, I want what you're taking, <laughs> whatever medication that is. <laughs> you know, both concepts were really just trying to, in my mind, this was females, but what I love out of the juggle is real is it's really, I've had as many men I had at Excel conference in Chicago where I saw you. I had an advisor come up to me that I didn't know, and he found me and introduced himself and said one of the nicest things I've ever heard, which was, I love the juggle is real. If my two girls could be anything like you, I'd, I'd be so happy. Oh. And I thought, oh, my gosh, are you sure? You know, they, <laughs> thank you so much. You know, but I'm, I'm a very anxious, stressed out person. You know, maybe they could do something a little lighter. <laughs> but no, I was just joking with him. He loved the video, but it, it related to him as right. a working dad. and. That was an unexpected kind of delight as well that we're talking to both parties. 
And in my mind, kind of creating these, it was if any young mom, any female in general found some comfort in what I was doing, or I improved their professional life, or they just knew that they weren't by themselves, that felt like I was making a difference. So yeah, we'll include a link out to the the Jugglers Real videos as well for people who want to check it out. So again, this is episode 136. So if you go to kidsis.com slash 136, we'll, we'll have some links out in the, in the show notes resources area. But for people who are listening, can you just describe like, what is it? I mean, what do people see? Like, what's the, what's the deal of watching the juggle is real videos? Yeah. So the juggle is real. They're, they're around two minutes on average. They're very short, funny. They usually start out talk the, the first couple of episodes we did film in New York in studios. So It's really setting the stage about, you know, things that have happened to me. There's some pictures of my kids, but just that there is no perfect family. And so kind of let's, let's shatter that image and let's Matt Ackerman and I and our team that we produce this with at Investment News. The idea is for us, we really were trying to accomplish that you could watch this and know that like I can share my stuff too. And then maybe eventually that FOMO kind of starts to go away for everybody. Or some people are legitimately depressed now over social media because they have this. Yeah, like all all you see is like all the good stuff of everyone else's life and you live the bad stuff in your life because we all have some bad stuff. We tend not to broadcast the bad stuff, only the good stuff. And you know, you, you get... I think stuck in this rut, like everybody else's life looks glorious and my life is feeling less glorious and, and it gets depressing. Like I, yeah, I talk about that as the iceberg illusion in our industry. You know, we see everyone else's success and all of our own challenges and it feels like our business is harder than others, but it's, it's more than just a business context. Like it's, it's seems like everything, the social media realm just amplifies that disparity. Right. And I had a friend whose father passed away and she had to actually disconnect from all social media because it was affecting her grief and her Uh, depression. Because if she saw someone, you know, with their dad or family picture, I mean, and I thought, gosh, you know, that hadn't thought about it that way. But so the juggle is real. They're they're fun to watch. I've had such a huge, overwhelming response from friends, industry people. I, it, it was one of, it's, it's been an incredibly successful for investment news as far as viewership and response. So I think most people like it. So take a look if you're listening. They're quick, they're fun. And I hope we go to season two and we'll, we've got some some funny stuff out there about that. And then you've mentioned this female advisor network as well. So what's what is that? So... Throughout my career, kind of as I've said, I've I've had a male business partner. When I went independent, we were a very with a very small broker dealer that didn't do any events, so I didn't know anybody really nationally. I mean, I knew a couple of advisors locally. I created a couple of kind of loose networking groups for just women business owners, like you know, grab wine. But I, I really didn't feel like I had a network of female advisors that I knew. And at Merrill, when I was starting out. There was, I'm sure there were some in the program. I only knew like maybe one or two, but I, I would have found a lot of value in a, in a community of support that I felt I could go to and say, either this is working or isn't working or help me. I had some older advisors that were female in my office, but they had already built their business, valuable relationship in a different way. But the cold calling days were were really over in my opinion. And so they had built their businesses that way. And, and I'm trying to do it different. It was, you know, trying desperately to, to keep my job and to, to continue in a career path that at the time I really liked uh, unexpectedly. And so in my mind, this has just been going on for years, like trying to find the community. And I, I was just determined that, that surely the community is out there, that there's some sort of group of us. And I've had study groups. I'm currently in a male and female, we call ourselves Dangerous Minds, but it's some awesome advisors I've met on Twitter. And then I have a women's study group that formed out of the Ladenberg Thalman Institute for Women in Finance. And they've been very influential to me. And so kind of one day I thought, you know, I really can't find the buy advisors for advisors community I've been looking for. There's some broker dealer conferences. There's some diversity initiatives. There's some like investment news has a women's summit. That's fantastic that I've been to, but this is not to knock those because I I, I want to work in a complimentary way with them. I, I think there's Definitely room for both if, and, and pay maybe more, but I wanted to create more of a community that wasn't just around going to a conference and then if you can't go, you don't see that person again. But really, there was more consistency right. with the with the conversation and it really being personal and professional growth driven practice management. 
you know, there's, I keep joking, there won't be a, a conference call about a muni, about the muni bun market. It's going to be, you know, there'll be a webinar about maybe marketing strategies for your practice. I really w- felt strongly that it should be affiliation agnostic. I'm interested to see how the broker dealers respond to that. Some have already been very on board. So meaning like not specific to whether you're an IRA or a broker dealer or who you're affiliated with. And yes, exactly. Okay. Because I think there's a lot to learn all around and I've been on both sides and they're very different. You know, I don't know if some broker dealers will worry about us commingling, stealing their people, but I, I, I can hardly imagine that would be really the case. So, Well, good, good broker dealers would in theory help hope that they're going to get to recruit people, not, not lose them. Right. Exactly. That, and that's kind of my mentality as well. This yeah. should be good, good for your advisors. But so, yeah, so it, it's got a lot of different programs in it. We're building it out. The industry response, as far as some of the large, large organizations that want to be a part of it are, that's just been really exciting. And it made me feel very validated that this, that this was needed and that people do you think it's a good idea? And, you know, I'm hoping it it grows and helps us retain some of the advisors. I think that's been a, you know, as you know, the numbers just haven't been good. Yeah. And and so can you help people understand just like what does it mean to join or be involved? Like is is there a cost? What do you what do you get for it? Like how does this actually work? Yes. So it's a national membership organization, just like an industry association. It's $199 a year. There's a student membership that is $49 a year. So female students can join. Right now, the only requirement for joining, and that's been something I've had a hard time with, I'm having to kind of, now I've put membership under review. And I just had a discussion with one of the founders of women in ETFs. And for women out there listening, that is a great other organization in the ETF mm. industry. But they've kind of had the same problem. We, we don't want recruiters in it. The intention right now for the organization is female financial advisors. So you have to be a producing female financial advisor. We don't really want people in there pushing sales and, and things like that or recruiting. So that's going to turn members away. And I know I don't like that and wouldn't appreciate it. Right. There's a partner marketplace within it. So that's where a lot of my industry relationships or companies have come to me and said, we want to be a part of this. And so they offer promotional pricing and discounted. The promotional pricing might be like one month free. The discounted pricing is usually on their monthly subscription models. And so been thrilled and grateful and overwhelmed with all the people that are in that marketplace. And we're growing that. I've basically been on a call every single day with somebody that we're discussing on being a a partner or or a part of this organization in some way, shape or form. So that's been very exciting and time consuming. The membership also includes a retreat and that is a workshop led, really relationship building, deep dive into yourself and your practice and how you can improve it. And that we partnered with Orion for that. And um, that's in September at a very luxurious retreat-like utopian kind of place called the Inn at Serenby. It's it's 30 minutes outside of Atlanta. I wanted a place where women could – I think women don't always disconnect. We we can often be responsible for a lot of people and things. And I wanted – to create, you know, selfishly, I want to go to this, you know, a, a beautiful place that they can really un- unwind it, be over a weekend, untie from the devices and really focus on yourself. And, and I think when I've done that, three days has helped the next, you know, year. So I'm excited for the partnership with that and the opportunity for me to recharge and, and do the same thing myself. Cause I, I know I don't do it with two little kids and business and, so, so as you look overall at the the journey over the past nearly fifteen years now, what's surprised you the most about building your advisory business? That I'm still here. <laughs> it's been hard. I mean, I I really don't sugarcoat that. It has been some days unbearably hard. Being a a business owner and a and a mother, my pregnancies were difficult. My maternity leaves were a joke. It's been very hard. And I'll tell you, so I was kind of reflecting. So it was really around now, 10 years ago, that Matt and I started working together every day. It was about July, August of t- 2009. And this morning I was reflecting, looking at my calendar and it said to be on your podcast, you know, and it was so surreal. And I got very emotional because I'm very proud of myself 
for the persistence because there are a whole lot of days where there wasn't a lot of money being made and there was a whole lot of liability and there was a whole lot of miss from my kids. And there was just a whole lot of work that I don't think people saw. Right. And to have this, you know, the network and and the people that I know that encourage me is, um, has been moving, I guess, to say the least. So 10 years ago, I was in a very different place and I'm, I'm very surprised I'm still here, <laughs> but I'm glad it's been a rewarding career to say the least. So you talk about how it's, hard and and some days unbearably hard is is that the is that the advisory business itself is that the stress of clients is that the the pain of trying to manage business and family all on top of each other is that just the brutalness of going out and trying to market just helping get clients in a very competitive <laughs> environment like what's what's the what's the part to you that that just makes it so hard and so rough it's really all of it at the same time is difficult and I, I've told males in our business whose wives stay home that are advisors, you know, and I say, well, you, you know, I don't mean this rude, but I do your job and your wives. And I don't always have, you know, the ability to have the same time allocated to, you know, the birthday parties, the, you know, I, I do that at midnight. In fact, I, my son just turned eight and in July and eh, he hadn't had a birthday party. I just realized. So, I've, I've promised him one, but that's life. You know, that's life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's really, it's not one thing. I, I do think our business is difficult. I think that the change in the last, a lot of the regulatory change and the entrance of some of the competitors hasn't affected me that much, but I worry about the future a little bit, you know, how that kind of shakes out. But I think the hard part is, you know, trying to get in, in 24 hours, all that needs to be done and what, usually sacrifices is or gets sacrificed for sure when my kids were even younger. So we were discussing before we started recording, my children are two boys, five and eight years old. You know, if you look at, I've had this business 10 years and my son is eight. Well, I had to have him, you know, I was pregnant for nine months before that. So for nearly the entirety of of building a career, I was pregnant, nursing, had a toddler, (laughs) was changing diapers. Sometimes I was nursing, I meant pregnant and had a toddler and was, you know, doing all of these things at once and trying to build our, our business where it was profitable and, you know, marketing that and having so many events, dealing with daycare, dealing, you know, so what, what always got sacrificed was me and, and my needs. And I, I think that's why the Female Advisor Network, I just envision if it could have helped me at the time, I I think I just would have been better off. I I would have had a a little bit more of a lifeline to people that could tell me it would be all right and maybe give me a little more support and and resources. But yeah, I mean, it's it's not one thing. It's just being on top of all of it, all of the time, being the lead parent. And that's what came out of the juggle is real too. So both of, both of those kind of came out of my, my experience that I'm, I don't know that grateful for is the right word, but I'm hoping that some good to help other people came out of it, but it's tough. And I think most of the female young or the females in my situation that I've heard on your podcast kind of say the same. I hear a similar story to a degree, but it's everything all the time. Yeah. So what was the, what was the low point for you on the journey? Well, this is where my story was similar to the advisor in Oregon that you interviewed. So we d- we really realized that a, the small broker dealer we had was limiting our, and I was not, I did not love that broker dealer. Nice people, but they they really started to fall apart. They're they're no longer in business. But we realized it was too small, and that w- our business had grown to a point where we had to make a change, and we had avoided that because it is painful for probably too long. And went through the process of finding a new broker dealer. We we were also about to launch practice makeover with investment news, a series we did a few years ago. And at the last minute after it was all done, the broker dealer was saying they didn't approve it anymore. And oh. it, it was just a nightmare. And and so we decided to change broker dealers, found Triad. We were we submitted the resignation, started the onboarding process, and I had a one year old and a three year old, three and a half year old. And our lead operations person and our, the only one that was really experienced in operations, supposed to run that project, left us. 
And she, she moved and I understand her decision. It was just horrible timing for us. And I just remember thinking like, I just, I quit. I mean, all I wanted to do was just quit. Like this isn't, I don't make enough money for this nightmare. And I need, I want to be home with my babies. And I wasn't sleeping at night. I had a teething one year old and I had a toddler that was going through kind of some night tears. And I remember lying on the floor of my nursery, holding my one-year-old's hand through the crib and just it was probably two o'clock in the morning and just sobbing my eyes out to the point I couldn't breathe. Just thinking I can't take it. I, and luckily we already, we had two people. The, the one person was new. That's Adam. Who's been with us and been amazing to us for four and a half years now, but he was able to step in and learn it quickly. And he and I got it done together and, and we did it well, but that truly that night was, I just, I don't know. I thought it, it's just not worth it. I can't take it anymore. I quit. <laughs> I, just didn't, yeah. I was just never going to show up again. But again, I'm glad I had persistence because I just thought, if, you know, I've got to pick my head up and this is a good change. And I, I've got people that rely on me and this is what we have to do. So I made a plan and we did it. I was going to say, I mean, what, what, what pulls you through this when you're, when you're going through those moments? It's just, I'm just passionate about what we do and I'm, I'm very, I mean, I'm dedicated. It's my company. You know, these are, these are people that rely on me and we've become very close to most of our clients. We care about them a lot and and a lot of mutual respect and like, and, you know, so there's a commitment factor, but there's really an underlying passion and drive. But yeah, I mean, it's tough. And friends, I mean, I, I've, I've had some incredible, my partner having a partner, but I don't, I don't, I don't think I do this by myself. I, I would have really no interest at this point doing this by myself, but some really amazing industry friends and peers that I could go to that I'd intentionally found and developed over time. And, and I know now that for right now, those are the people that really get me through it and, and they know I lean on them. So what would your advice be to young advisors, maybe young, young women advisors in particular that are looking at coming into the business or going down this road and are, are, you know, struggling with some of the same fears and challenges that, that you've been through. I would say join the female advisor network (laughs) so that you have some community immediately, but no, so find your people. I mean, I, that really, was important to me. Even, even when I was at Merrill, you know, having coffee with Matt Archer, who knew that three years later he would become my business partner. And now, you know, 10 years later, still be partners, you know, in a, in a thriving advisory practice. And so I think understanding that other advisors can add value to you and not looking at, at people in a competitive way, but really finding your tribe that can support you when you have those bad days. Cause they're going to happen every, I mean, even, even the most successful advisors have some really, you know, th- their stories can be very poignant on some of their really hard times that you would have no clue they had those days. Yep. And so I think just finding as quickly as you can, some people that you can really connect with and lean on that are, are in this business. I mean, I've got some great friends, but they don't always understand this business and some of the trials right. that go, go through but also to be able to learn from them. And I have, I have relationships with, and I always have with male mentors and friends, female mentors and friends, some in fintech, some in at broker dealers, they they kind of run the gamut and in, in, in media. Right. I've always tried to introduce myself. I'm fearless with that. I, I introduced myself when we were in Nashville, when you were a keynote speaker, because I, I genuinely believe that I'm a connector and, and I think your network can really I I can make introductions to people that would would help them, but that my network has benefited me more than anything. Nobody's given me anything other than just, you know, support or maybe made some introductions thinking, Hey, this person you, you get some value out of, but it's not like I asked them for favors, but they've been a support system to say, Hey, I've been there. You know, this is what I did or how I handled it. And that's been beneficial and vice versa. I have a lot of people that look to me and I think it's funny, the female advisor network, kind of the epiphany was, one night recently, or before I launched it, I was sitting and I realized that my sitting on my patio having a glass of wine, and I realized that my last ten text messages were some of the most influential people in the business. <laughs> and I was just like joking around with them, or like, I mean, 
our conversations didn't have anything about work. We've become great friends. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not that little girl at the wire house beaten down anymore. I'm hmm. where I kind of always hoped I wanted to be. And, and, and more than anything, as far as opportunities, I've been able to write for financial planning magazine. That's been, you know, continue to do that. So just the opportunities I've had, th- but it's been through just introducing myself and being very genuine. I think that's the other thing is being genuine and offering to do things for other people because power of reciprocity is huge. And I think people genuinely want to help other people. So that's my couple of things. So as, as we wrap up, this is a, a podcast around success. And, and one of the themes that always comes up is just that word success means different things to different people. And so you, you know, you've had this successful path persevering over a lot of, a lot of challenges, a lot of family balance challenges along the way, as you said, the juggle is real and, you know, getting to a, I think what anybody would objectively call a, a successful firm now is you're, you're closing in a hundred million dollars under management with a partner and still have decades literally to grow from here. So I'm wondering just as you look at this from the the personal perspective, how do you define success for yourself at this point? Success for me really means, have I influenced or improved somebody's life? It's never, I've never had a drive around money. I mean, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. Certainly I, I understand that. And I, I, I enjoy our company revenue, you know, seeing it grow and things like that, but that doesn't drive me. That's not what drove me through bad days. It's that, you know, being successful. And when I, if I step back and say, am I successful today? It's like, yeah, I I think we're improving people's lives. And I think I've, I've influenced some people in a positive way and, that's that's what I think I'm successful. So that's at the end of the day when we close the door here or I go to bed, that's what fulfills me. And that to me means success. Well, very cool. I, I hope then we get to help amplify that platform for you a little with this podcast and sharing out your perspective for, I, I think, a few people who want and need to hear that message that, you know, th- this stuff is hard and it's hard for everyone. And it's okay if you feel those moments to cry a little when tough tough things happen in the business. But then, you know, as you've shown, I think the then you pick yourself up and you figure out how you're going to persevere and you work through it and you do. And and that to me is ultimately what really defines who ends up being successful or not. You know, as you as you said earlier, like there's this social media effect that's amplified that it looks like everybody's else everybody else's life is happy and cheery and like only yours has difficult times and. And that's not really what happens. I, I think you give a much better reflection of it, which is difficult stuff happens to everyone. And, and it makes us all emotional and stressed from time to time. The question is, you know, have your moment, <laughs> whatever that challenge is. But then what are you doing to pick yourself up and persevere? And and what support system do you have to help with that or a, or an entire network to help with that? Yeah. And I, I really just want to thank you so much for having me on here and letting me share about my projects and passion projects really, but also share, hopefully some advisors can learn from how we do business. And I'm happy if anyone wants to reach out to me and expand further on our process or how we use different things. It's been a treat for me and I'm I'm genuinely very, very grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Nina, for joining us on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.